Hey, everybody, I'm your host, Jedi Hill, where we talk about freedom in all aspects, whether it's the mental, the financial, the time freedom. And today is going to be a very special guest. Uh, he's author of the upcoming book, Green Paradise Lost, where we talk about historical green energy and energy freedom. Thank you very much, Phil uh, Vecchio, right? Vecchio, Vecchio. yeah, hard to see. It's an Italian word that means old, so I'm going to die an old man. It's a guarantee. Aha. There you go. And, and, and old is still just a state of mind, you know. Absolutely. You know, age is just a number, but getting old is a disease that we can prevent and cure. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I never had a choice in the matter because I've been old since the day I was born. No. <laughs> right. So. I might, might have been born at night, but it wasn't last night. <laughs> right, right. For sure. Well, thank so. you very much for Phil being on. I'm this historic green energy, the green paradise loss. I, I'm really here about this because, you know, we're talking about the freedom and, you know, a lot of people for energy are wanting to do solar panels and wind and yeah. hydro. And the hydro is actually a huge portion of our power grid and has been for like 100 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, right now I moved, uh, I moved recently to a place called Schenectady, New York. And Schenectady, New York is the home of uh, General Electric. One of the interesting things with uh, with General Electric was that they were consuming so much electricity in the early days that they were trying to get power from wherever they could. So there was a number of small hydroelectric plants that were built within um, the upstate New York Capital District region around Albany, New York, that were um, that they started building the first transmission lines um, from these small hydroelectric plants in uh, places like uh, you know Water Valley and. Um, and uh, up north of Troy in Mechanicville, there were these um, very small, um, you know, hydroelectric plants by, by modern standards that became kind of um, the, the backbone to the early um, electric grid. Um, and it's, it's actually really interesting, too. Um, I was uh, doing some uh, research because there was an old um, railroad that used to go through the town I grew up in in East Greenbush. I uh, used to be part of the uh, Albany to Boston Railroad. Um, and after it kind of went out of, uh, they changed the route of the, the railroad, they had a trolley. And the first trolley that went through there, it was electric and it was powered by a small hydroelectric dam. Um, so it's really amazing that this um, electrified transportation was something that was very common 100 years ago. And we're kind of talking about it now again. But it's this thing that, um, you know, kind of as time went on. Uh, was kind of lost in favor of a large centralized power grid. Well, you had the large centralized power grid, and then you had the internal combustion engines. Definitely. Which it was just easier to recharge the vehicle by pouring a can of gas in or fuel oil or whatever the case may be. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't want to be, um, when, and when I talk about Green Paradise Lost, I don't really want to be utopian and say, oh, it was the greedy oil companies that killed the electric car. No, there was a lot of problems with early battery technology, especially for mobile power applications. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the internal combustion engine was the best technology at the time. I think it's still a great technology now. Um, even if you want to use electric drivetrains, having a, um, uh, an onboard gas generator is probably still one of the best ways to transport uh, a vehicle. And um, so hybrids. Hybrids, absolutely. Um, you know, GM doesn't get enough credit, but the Chevy Volt is actually a hybrid. It's not mm -hmm. a true, um, true electric vehicle. It's got a big battery in it, but it also has a small gasoline generator on board. Oh, and the new Jeeps. I, I, I'm waiting. This is like actually got me debating between the Cybertruck and the new Jeep Rubicon that's supposed to be coming out. Oh, yeah. Because uh, they haven't got it in the bigger edition. That's like their little mini truck, but it's right. supposed to be coming out this year. Um, the, they have a true hybrid for their Jeeps. That's great. It is a toggle switch. <laughs> so you can physically toggle it to the battery, leave it on auto or toggle it to the gas. So unlike the more advanced electronic ones, nobody can shut you off from single space. It is hardwired the way you yes. want it to go. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's going to be a big issue kind of going forward is we've seen... Um, power increasingly and and um, the ability to turn on and off transportation as a method of control um and yeah, so Ford I think just got in trouble for this um mm -hmm. by people buying it because their new truck that they recalled could actually like repossess itself <laughs> <laughs> 
drive myself all the way back to the repo lot. I heard about that. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah, well, and that's the thing is, is I think that, um, you know, and, and we got to think about what was happening. So um, one, of the, one of the kind of the pivot points that I see with um, American Energy is the rural electrification program. Um, now, uh, did you go to um, did you go to public school like I did? I did go to public school, but luckily I had quite a bit of other books and outside education, so I didn't get quite as indoctrinated as the uh, typical person there. Absolutely, same here. Uh, but you probably heard just as much as I did how how wonderful rural electrification was. Tennessee Valley Authority. All these big transmission lines where these, you know, the Hicks hillbillies out in the nature didn't know what was good for them until we brought them good old electric lights. Um, you know, and that was a big thing was um, the rural electrification became this big tipping point where uh, we, we went from um, because the idea at the time was, you know, and this is something that you hear a lot of government planners talk about. They hear the concept of economies of scale that, you know, Ford or GM will have. And they say, oh, well, we need to implement economies of scale, but they're central planners. So they really don't know what that is or when it's appropriate. So, um, so this central is planning is bad, folks. Just so you central, know, it never works. Central planning absolutely. is bad. Government is never the solution to the problem. Absolutely. Um, so, so what ended up happening was they said, okay, well, what we want to do is we want to build these big hydroelectric dams, megawatt power. Um, you know, so they built huge dams in in uh, in Tennessee the, uh, Valley, but they also built the Hoover Dam, uh, and Niagara so Falls, the, and yep, Niagara Falls was huge. And Niagara Falls actually predates this, though. Um, Niagara Falls was built with Nikola Tesla and Westinghouse as a pilot project. So um, I'll give Niagara Falls a pass because that actually was a capitalist in, invention right there. Um, fair point. Fair point. And uh, but um, even so. Um, you know, and, and there was the current wars with between Tesla and and uh, and Edison. Uh, Edison, right? And uh, there's there's positives and negatives to both. And uh, unfortunately, too, I think that um, you know there probably was better applications for different places. So um, up in, even still in the 1920s, there's still a lot of um, DC um, home power plants being used. Um, one of the things that really kind of motivated me for this was reading about the wind industry in the 1920s. Um, the wind industry was massive. It was huge. It was, um, you know, lots of households throughout the, the um, uh, throughout the Midwest, the, you know, all these farm, farm places. Um, you still see today kind of the remnants of. Um, yeah, they had their own big windmills. Yeah, they like powered windmills. everything. Absolutely. Um, and you still see this with water pumping. Um, I took a train out to California, and it was amazing how in all the West, there's still these like 20 bladed little windmills that pump water. Um, and uh, and then I was I was riding the train with an Amish guy and he said, oh, yeah, I have one of those on my farm. Um, and uh, it's really amazing that, you know, you know, it's just a simple technology where the wind blade, the windmill blade turns, it moves a pump. Um, but it was really kind of a straightforward shot to going from what well, we're going to pump water with this to we're going to generate electricity for our house with that. So um, there was a huge um, wind wind industry and then it really died in um, the 1930s when uh, you know good old Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, decided that he wanted to be in charge of uh, how Americans get power. So the New Deal. Yeah. Like most of the problems in America now, we can trace it back to either FDR or Woodrow Wilson. So, um, uh, or, or so the yeah. Obamacare and yeah. the Biden inflation now. <laughs> Definitely, absolutely, for sure. Um, so, yeah, that's something that I think that uh, you know, when we're looking at, um, you know, when we're looking at this this problem, um, you know, we have an opportunity now because there's a large developing world that doesn't have a big centralized power grid. Um, as we look at like, they're talking about replacing our power grid now with a lot of, a lot of different stuff. Um, you know, the, everything that's happening now is happening now with, um, uh, you know, with the uh, promise that we can just, you know, subsidize this and tweak that um, without dealing with the core issue of what actually caused the problem to begin with, so. Well, even when you're looking at Bitcoin and everything else, they're going more towards the decentralization now. 
you have even in America more the smarter people are at least trying to live off grid, have their solar panels, their wind turbines, make their own water. Definitely. Uh, I know there's one I was looking at last year that I didn't get because I got at Leo right at the end of last year, still kicking myself on the butt for uh, not going through this one because the far it was a small farm, but it actually had a gas oil well that didn't have mm. a lease on it. Wow. So I could sell the 200 barrels of oil at market and then have basically unlimited gas. And I was just going to build a water turbine from the well. That's amazing. And I could have produced enough power for, you know, a small neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that was actually what um, what Westinghouse did. He lived in the middle of Pittsburgh and he, he just, and I don't think his wife was very fond of it, but he drilled a, a natural gas well in his backyard and started selling it to, to his neighbors. Um, this was something that was, you know, very common, you know, back in the day was just like uh, people, you know, finding new forms of energy and, and exploiting it for, for their own good. Um, and it kind of goes along with the classic American ingenuity of, you know, we you fix your own tractor, you, um, you know, make, mend and make do and um, something that I think we've lost to an extent, but it was um, a big part of the American character at the time. For sure. Well, I was even looking into fractional distillation, like, okay, if, mm. if we know what's happening with the issues in the Biden administration starting the war in Ukraine, the China yeah, getting ready to invade Taiwan and all this other crazy stuff going on. It's like, okay, 200 barrels of oil a year, if I can split that into half diesel, half gasoline and just yep. a little leftover mix. I, I and that's still know if I can make my vehicles on the farm and tractors and everything run while yeah. everybody else is out of everything. Yeah, absolutely. And that was really an issue, too, that, um, you know, kind of came up in World War II, where a lot of these technologies were kind of, you know, um, so-called rediscovered, uh, because during the war, there was huge rationing. And um, and I think as a libertarian, you know, anti-all war, I mean, you know, and I, but I think it's, uh, you know, something that um, when you look at um, some of the, some of the uh, supply constraints that Britain had, that the U.S. had, there was, um, you had to turn, you know, your lights on and off at certain times. There were blackouts. Um, there were oil rations, rubber rations. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so there was a lot of technology at the time, like uh, they would use wood gas. So they'd put these big old, um, you know, uh, tanks of wood gas, you know, wood gasifiers in the front of their car. And then these, the, um, they would gasify the wood. It would break it, like you were saying, you know, with a fractional distillation, it would break down the hydrocarbons of the wood into ones that they could use in their car. They'd have a pipe going from this wood gasifier straight to their gas tank, and they would, you know, run with that, or they would use, um, they'd have these big, what they call gas bags um, on top of like the buses and stuff like that. So in, in London, on these double decker buses, on the top deck, what they would do is they would put um, these, yeah, these big rubber, rubber cases full of um, natural, like methane or, you know, some other type of uh, wood gas product that would you know pipe in and it was i mean less you know compact it was harder to deal with but it was stuff that was uh within the realm of technical ability at the time um so well it's fascinating as you go back what all was available what we could do what's not being done today um i know for current events we are horribly well we're not but the government is horribly draining our strategic oil reserve definitely which means, you know, I and OPEC just announced they're reducing their production by another 1.5 million barrels a day. Wow. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, a barrel of oil is 42 gallons, which is such a weird number that they pick. But, you know, 42, Secret to Life, Universe, and everything else. If you know that movie, make sure you put it down in the comments below. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to be the uh, hitchhiking uh, if, I, if I run out of gas, if, if I can drop a little hint. So There you go. There you go. So let's get back to this historic green energy. Like, what are you, what's your conclusions with your research of what, where we can go now or, you know, the dangers of the big grid and the government oversight, things like that? Yeah, definitely. So, um I think a big thing is that um, there's there's a few um, huge technologies that I think we can kind of look into. Um, one is um, so I, I think that everybody should be looking into having a home battery um, of some kind, and mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think it's it's something that um, you know really was a big part of a lot of rural systems at the time, and they would use a lot of times lead acid batteries. 
But there's other uh, battery chemistries, and one that's actually still very viable is uh, nickel iron. Um, this was called Edison battery. Um, these uh, some of these batteries have been used for a hundred years. Um, you just need to, it's it's a little more um, requires a little more maintenance because you need to rewater these. Um, they're heavy. They're good for stationary power. He had actually developed them for uh, electric cars to work with Henry Ford, but it wasn't good for that application. Um, you know. So what yeah. what battery did they use in the Nautilus? Uh, the Nautilus, it was a sodium battery, right? Sodium mercury, good man, good man. Awesome, yeah, I just watched, watched that movie recently. It's, it's great, uh, Jules Verne and all, and all that. Yeah, he was he knew his stuff. Well, and the sodium mercury batteries, like those are fascinating. Like when I was a kid, even regular batteries had little bits of mercury in them and the batteries lasted so much longer than these lithium ion and things yeah. we have now. Yeah. But they took them off the market because of the mercury. <laughs> but yeah, not the lead batteries. Yeah, not the lead ones. <laughs> it's hilarious to me. But like with the mercury, it's like I know if you have a giant vat of mercury, mm. the amount of electrical storage as that compounds and gets a bigger volume is just mind boggling. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and and um and I think that that's something that um, you know, when people uh, like should be looking at these different battery chemistries, I think um, the one that's the easiest and most user friendly right now is lithium iron phosphate. Um, and it's but one they also catch fire. <laughs> no, no, no. These actually don't catch fire. So um, the thing is that lithium ion does, um, but lithium iron phosphate because it's got an iron. Oh, iron, phosphate. not ion. Yes. Iron. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And that's and that's I think a, a co very common mistake. People hear lithium iron phosphate and they think, oh, lithium ion, um, and they're two different things. But the using, um, but the iron chemistry is a lot more stable than the manganese chemistry that they use in a lot of, um, which is a conflict mineral, which is you know being mined in the Congo and, and whatever else. So um, lithium iron phosphate is a much better battery chemistry. It's just not as energy dense, so it's maybe not as good for like electric vehicles. But they are even using them in electric vehicles as well. Um, and uh, it's more common like in some of the Chinese ones. Um, but for a home battery, if you want something that's really easy and plug and play, lithium iron phosphate is kind of where to go right now. Um, yeah, I'm looking for the uranium batteries when those come out as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, there was <laughs> another one I read about. I can't remember. It wasn't the uranium, but it was another radio tech active isotope where they said it would last for like 10,000 years before needing recharged. Yeah, there's uh, so they're, they're um, encasing uh, radioactive elements within uh, within carbon lattice diamonds, and those are the ones I think you're, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's you can make a, a a minor version of that with um, a solar cell, and they sell these little like um, uh, radioactive. Uh, it's it's more of a novelty where it's like a little test tube with a radioactive element in it, and it um, the radioactive element hits up against phosphors, and it glows. And then you use that light to power a solar cell. Uh, but in this, there's beta voltaics. So there's there's small um, like um, batteries that they use for like uh, pacemakers and stuff like that that are um, on the market. But they're usually very expensive and don't produce enough electricity at the moment to be practical for anything other than like um, you know keeping the clock in your computer going and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so, but yeah, and um, I, I think another big thing is um, combined heat and power. This is something that um, some larger systems are doing now, but um, I think is often overlooked for home, home systems where, um, and this is really something that was really um, kind of a tragedy that it was lost. Um, like in, in New York City right now, they have large electrical generation plants uh, and they, they uh, not just produce electricity, but they run steam to all the skyscrapers. So that there's that famous uh, picture of Marilyn Monroe with the steam going up her skirt, uh, which would be incredibly painful. Um, but it's, uh, you know, but that's uh, uh, movie magic right there. But yeah, so the, the um, combined heat and power takes um, like the 40% of, of um, turning fuel into electricity and then scavenges another 30 to 40% out of, for heat. And so when you're talking about like um, having like a, having a natural gas generator, you can then use like the radiator to boil your, to heat your water for domestic hot water, um, stuff like that. and um, that's something that I think um, within the 1920s, there's still a lot of people who had steam engines. 
Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that is really kind of a, um, again, a technology that was lost because um, you could have had people with firewood running steam engines and heating their home with the same, with the same, uh, same fuel and a fuel that they could have actually produced on their home. Um, and so that's something that, um, you know, I think we should, yeah. Hold up there, hold on, hold on. You, you, yeah, yeah. You're, you're telling me, and this is for the audience here, you're telling me we could use wood to create yeah. our heat, our electricity, a renewable resource that you're not dependent on the government, and you can completely supply your own power. 100%. 100%. And that's something that I really wanted, one of the another reasons why I wanted to write this book is because I really kind of wanted to use whatever money I, I made from the book to invest in, you know, creating that type of a, in that kind of a technology and technologies that are similar. Um, there's another engine too that's because um, steam can be a little bit scary. Steam, mm -hmm. you're building up pressure, they blow up. It's it's intimidating. Um, there's another engine that was developed called the Stirling engine, and this is one that's very, you know, has been um, used by NASA. They're talking about doing it again with nuclear power, where they're using the uh, the isotopes to heat up one side of the Stirling engine and then the coolness of space, you know, and it basically just runs off of the delta, the change of temperature. Mm -hmm. And um, you can, um, and so um, another thing I was thinking about with something like a Stirling engine is that you could have um, solar hot water, which is again, another technology that they had in the 1920s uh, and before. Um, there was actually a steam engine in Paris that was run off of a solar, a parab parabolic solar trough. Um, and this was back in the 1870s. So this is um, so you could you could have it where you have solar power kind of keeping your 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 water warm, and then you have your wood heat heating it up to the point where you really need it. So um, you could kind of reduce your your um, your burnt consumption with solar with this kind of combined system too. So it, it, it's so fascinating. What's available what's being hidden and restricted uh like i've got to see tesla's boundary layer pump for where they modified the tesla turbine to actually make it work as yep. opposed to just speeding up to too much and then burning out yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and um yeah because that's another technology that was was really common at the time um you know you think about like tur um, turbines too turbines aren't a new technology they've been around since the 1800s um, and, and a steam turbine, you know, and then the Tesla turbine is really interesting, too, because it, it works without vanes, right? That's um, they're just kind of like layers that kind of use the surface tension of like what, whether you make them out of CDs or metal or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, and that's another interesting technology that, you know, potentially could have been used, you know, for a car, for home generation, stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, I know the um, one guy, scientist who did that, they actually did that in a car. Mm. So it's like you see a jet stream of water going up in the air like 60 feet as it's propelling through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that, that's the thing that I think, you know, there's a lot of these technologies that existed maybe, and they maybe just need to be tweaked and, and um, used to some extent. Um, because, you know, and I was talking with a guy from Bangladesh back in uh, when I was in high school. It was really interesting because he was talking about how expensive his, his cell phone bill was. I said, oh, why don't you just get a landline? It's so much cheaper. He's like, in Bangladesh, we don't have landlines. When we built, so when we built and um, when we built out our, our infrastructure now, because we didn't have the infrastructure before, it's much cheaper and easier to build these cell phone towers because they're distributed and because they're closer to the people. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, we're kind of seeing now is, is that, um, this idea of the big centralized control with the, with copper going out to everybody's house mm -hmm. in remote areas is expensive. It's fragile. Um, there's a place up in the Adirondack Mountains here in New York where they were talking about um, putting in a, a battery system for a microgrid uh, up, I think, in Saranac Lake uh, because they've had so many blackouts just with, um, you know, the power going down and stuff like that, with the uh, trees in the winter time knocking out power. Mm -hmm. um, back in the day, Saranac Lake probably had their own hydroelectric plant and they probably had their own, you know, electric generation plant in town there. And um, and they could have, you know, likely used wood and stuff like that to not just create power, but, you know, generate heat for the homes as well within that, you know, small kind of 
rural or, or urban core. And these things are called microgrids. They're all the hotness now with all the central planners. But these were this was technology that was available in the 1920s. Yeah, I, I do like the microgrids just because the less reliance you have on the bigger central government, the better, because, you know, the government's not going to save you. There, there's going to be stuff happen. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I know with the New Atlantis project I'm working on, you know, I'm looking to have each main island have its own hydroelectric desalinization plant. So they're producing fresh water and electricity that yeah. can then be used to make other things. Absolutely. And this is where and there's a lot of islands like Hawaii and Puerto Rico where they kind of adopted this this centralized, you know, we, we need coal and oil to run stuff versus actually looking at the resources they had there to do what's appropriate for lo for the local people in terms of uh, cost, um, resiliency, because that's that's the only other thing too. It's not all just about cost. It's about, you know, is are, is your food going to go bad when the when the uh, power goes out? You know, there's a lot of different stuff like that that, um, you know, really gets lost. Um, you know, the, the ability to use heat for industrial processes, desalination. A um, mm -hmm. place like Hawaii would, you know, I mean, they've got enough rainwater in a lot of Hawaii, but um, you know, but the idea that, like in a lot of places, uh, California, Italy, you know, where my grandparents grew up in Sicily, there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, fresh water there. It was rain every so often. Um, using that, you know, using waste heat from uh, from generation is something that can 100% be used to create fresh and clean water for people. So, well, and with the desalinization, people like some of the environmentalists get on it because you're pumping salt water back into the ocean, but it's like, we don't have to pump the salt water back into the right. ocean. We can actually mine that salt water yeah. and extract the uranium, the lithium, the magnesium, magnesium. The sodium, calcium, yep. gold, silver, and so much more. Absolutely. That we yeah, can actually be purifying the water we're pumping back in and mining what we need to do the green revolution without having kids mining in the Congo and Argentina Absolutely. and everywhere else. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that's something that's often overlooked is, is what are some of the ancillary uh, benefits that come from something like that? And uh, yeah, you're right. It's because, um, yeah, I've, I've looked a little bit into um, some of the, some of the salt water mining and stuff like that in terms of getting usable chemicals. And it's, it's an amazing what you can do. A lot of stuff for battery chemistry. I mean, that, you're right. It's, um, and it's so often overlooked in, in favor of kind of the short term, you know, doom and gloom. Like it's got to be exactly the wind, the wind turbines that we designed and exactly the solar panels that we designed or nothing. So yeah, that's just greed and manipulation trying to crash the system. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and, and that's something, too, is, is um, you know, there's kind of this thing where I mean, we know that about, you know, the military industrial complex. But when somebody's talking about replacing an entire power grid, you know, you're telling me that there's not industrial interests trying to, you know, trying to take advantage of that. There's all kinds of money being thrown out there. And even I think BP and a lot of the oil companies are kind of behind this. They say, oh, well, we can get research from grants for algae, algae fuel, which might be a good idea. But, um, you know, they're really taking advantage of the fact that there's these subsidies and stuff like that. And it doesn't let the best technologies come to the top. Well, and we can even mine the seawater to create oil. This is yep. the one that's really going to mess with people's heads because uh, it's one of the ones I want to do on the island. You know, when you desalinate the water, you now have fresh water. You split that with electrolysis. You now have hydrogen and oxygen. So you store the hydrogen for fuel. You release the oxygen into the air, which improves the health right. of everything. Absolutely. Because we found even um, Odo Warburg, you know, got a Nobel Prize for finding the cause and cure of cancer back in like 1933, being the reduced level of oxygen, which is why Aspen, Colorado has had for 20 years that I, 20, 30 years that I know of hyperbaric oxygen chambers to help people get over cancer. Mm. <laughs> so so there, there's nice side effects when we do production. So you release the oxygen, then you just pull the carbon dioxide out of the salt water or out of the air. Recombine the CO2 and the hydrogen, you create your own ethanol, diesel, whatever you want. And we are carbon neutral without mining or anything else. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that this is all like, you know, relatively basic chemistry, but not, you know, and I think some of it's about making it economical and just kind of 
um, you know, finding ways to do it. But I think with 3D printers now, with um, a lot of technology that's coming along, I think it's going to be easier to rapidly iterate and to rapidly iterate um, on an individual level. And I think that that's something that I think people really need to be looking at. And um, like I've been talking with some people. Um, I have a friend of mine. He's from Zambia originally. I've been talking with like his cousin who's in high school and a couple other people that he knows from school. Um, and it's really interesting because they do live in kind of a rural area with kind of a spotty grid. And um, that's something that I, I think, um, you know, for me, you know, um, that's um, something that I'm really passionate about is that these places where there is like, um, you know, very, you know, combination of a grid and not a grid. Um, there's a power grid, but it's very spotty. Um, you know, times that it's on, times it's not. Um, and uh, some of the rural places, they still don't have a lot of power. And um, I think my biggest concern is that the U.S. is going to kind of try to um, encourage them to build what we have, which is something, too, where um, we kind of had um, like I think the power grid was kind of um, you know, it's kind of like how, uh, you know, bad behavior can sometimes be covered up with money. Um, mm -hmm. So you can, you know, if you're, um, you know, if you're living, a, a you know, um, you know, so you know, somebody who's like really wealthy can have like five mistresses. Um, but, uh, you know, because he has enough money to pay them off, uh, you know, but if you're, um, if you're a poor guy, you know, you better, you know, you better make sure you can afford the first lady. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where, um, where money covers up sometimes, uh, bad behavior, but, um, it's, it's something where, um, in a lot of these countries in terms of, um, creating sustainable growth, um, having these these um, you know uh, alternative energy technologies like wind, like solar, um, like with good with good batteries, uh, with hydroelectric, small hydroelectric, um, you know these are things that can uh, and even like using biomass and um, you know heat from that and and um, you know using Stirling engines, um, these can be sustainable ways to provide energy for people in rural areas. Um, to run tractors um, instead of doing manual, you know, literally uh, hoeing their their garden, um, you know, just uh, very traditional forms of agriculture. Um, even um, um, uh, getting moisture out of the air. Uh, this is something that's often not talked about, but um, you know, you can. There's you know rivers of air, and taking if you're in a place that's um, even like the Sahara Desert, there's enough moisture in the air if you can cool the air temperature down. To be able to collect usable amounts of water, especially for for people drinking, but even for agriculture and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it's absolutely amazing what we can do, and like we could make a Sahara Desert, which you can see over yep, here, right there, uh, over your shoulder. Make, yep, make, make it nice and green again if we really wanted to. Absolutely, I, I'm terraforming. Like people don't realize how much the droughts over the last few years have been man-made like all the stuff in cali they're draining too much water from the river system so it can't yep. cycle back over the way it's supposed to and, and, and you run it dry and you kill it yeah and the earth is alive you got to work with her not against her well i think that's a big thing too is that um the market reflects natural scarcity and and, and that's another book i want to work on eventually is is uh you know why water should be a commodity and not a not a utility uh, and I think that this is because this is kind of goes along with the concept of power being a, a utility is this idea that the government needs to control it and the government needs to um, to regulate it. Um, what we see in California is that there while well, we need to keep water affordable for everyone. But what it ends up is that the big interests buy access to water. So a lot of the almond farmers, um, a lot of the big industrial interests are able to buy a lot of the water rights up from the state without having to, with it not reflecting what the market price should be for water. So rather than, um, so then we, we end up creating scarcity. It's, it's water socialism. Um, and so um, you end up having scarcity there rather than having, okay, well, the price of water is going up. Let's try to innovate new ways to get water. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, it could be a, um, a gray water system that pumps gray water from LA up into the desert. Um, they're trying to get so bad in regulation in the Cali, not to interrupt you, but mm -hmm. like actually putting meters on people's wells for their own water coming out of the ground and start charging yeah. them for their own well, their own water. I, I, yeah. You want to charge me for using my own septic system that I built? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing too, is when California right now is going through tons of flood 
this is an arbitrage opportunity if there was a market in water. This mm -hmm. is the time to be building the dams and storing up that water. And um, in Israel, too, they, they um, actually will use the aquifers as storage. They will pump fresh water down into the ground because it's a way to store water. So if all of a sudden you have these floods and all of these, these farmers are pumping water down into the, uh, into the ground to restore the aquifer, um, you know, you have, you know, a net positive for the environment. You have, um, you know, you're not dra draining down that, that groundwater nearly as much uh, because the market says, you know, you want to save water now when it's, you know, when it's a burden, when it's, you know, free, and then you want to use it for later. And I think that that's one of the things that um, uh, we see also with energy, too, is, you know, if it's if it's subsidized and cheap, you know, you're going to use more of it. Um, you know, versus if, you know, um, I just I just put insulation in my house. And that's one of the things that, like, you know, maybe people would have started insulating their house 20 years earlier if, if it wasn't for the subsidies. Um, well, for that, there's so much technological suppression. Mm. Like, energy should be extremely cheap. Definitely. You know, I, I, I Tesla already figured out where we could just have our receivers pull it directly out of the ionosphere. Yep. Um, you've got people working on mini nuclear power plants that would fit inside your car to where your yep. car would just run for a hundred years without dying or having to do anything to it. Yeah. Um, there's plasma engines. We're working on solar fusion. Mm. Have, you seen, uh, chrono, have you seen Corona mass motors? Chrono mass murder. Corona mass, or, um, sorry, I might be saying it wrong. Um, uh, but yeah, those little triangle ones. So, so they, so there's, um, they build them like regular, like motors, but they take the atmospheric electricity. There's this guy on YouTube, but uh, I think it's Tesla uh, or um, Laser Saber, and he built a a drill where it uses one of these motors, where it's basically like um, they have like um, like copper windings and then like uh, like metal plates facing in one direction and then they have like an antenna going up into the up into the air and it collects the ions and it lets this motor go and so um there's still questions about well how much power are you getting out of it is it is it cost effective is it worthwhile but it's amazing that this guy was able to drill wood using a motor that was only from atmospheric electricity mm -hmm. um, and it's you know something where you know for remote applications for lighting for stuff like that especially now with leds LEDs make lighting so easy and so cheap. Um, but um, I mean, and again, kind of go back to what my thesis is, how much more would um, would uh, like uh, uh, fluorescent lights been adopted if you know people had to conserve their electricity on in rural areas? And how much more would um, energy efficient lighting have been in, you know, in just the ways that we use, use electricity? Refrigerators, um, there's ways that you can use, um, so, uh, a lot of RVs will use propane to run their refrigerator um, through something called the absorption uh, chilling process. Um, it evaporates water um, and then it, it condenses on the other side and pulls heat out as you have a um, chemical that likes to soak up. So like it's a salt water, like um, uh, lithium bromide is one, um, just even calcium chloride, um, salt that you put out on your driveway. That's another one. Um, but it would just like heat it up and you could do it with solar power. You could do it with waste heat. Uh, and, and probably, you know, this type of thing would have been able to scavenge heat for running your refrigerator rather than needing electricity. But because we put, we ran electricity to everyone, these technologies kind of languished and became niche. You know, uh, again, they're using RVs because you're off grid. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and the off grid is going to be bigger because I mean, we've seen this winter, like Europe was having horrible issues with their power yep. grid because not having enough fuel and energy because they tried to centralize everything. And with us draining the strategic power reserves, you know, your need to be self sustaining is going through the roof, literally. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that's what we've kind of come across is that the fragility of the system of, that's centrally planned. Um, you know, I think I always go back to the story of the, the Irish and the potato famine. They only had one type of potato. So when a, uh, a bug came through, the, you know, when, uh, when a plant disease came through, it went through all of the plants. And so I think the biggest advantage of not having a centralized system is that redundancy, is that, um, 
you know, and, and uh, not just from natural disaster, but also from price spikes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if we're, we're only using oil for our energy, well, what happens when the price of oil goes up? We're all in trouble. But if we're using wind and nuclear and, you know, hydroelectric and um, solar and all these different things, you know, it might go up in one area, but these other areas might still be relatively inexpensive. So. Well, yeah, because we don't want to go back to the dirty coal. Absolutely. Which I is just... what they've been doing in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, you know, it's they... fascinating. Yeah. They're chopping up their forests and everything. And the only reason they made it through, it was a abnormally mild winter for the Northern Hemisphere this year. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, and I think one of the things that um, they're really exploring more in Europe and in the U.S. now that is great is they're look, starting to look at nuclear power again. Um, you know, I think all these technologies, too, are, are great for distributed systems. Uh, and I, but I think nuclear works well for distributed systems if you do it right. Um, but it's, it's kind of that almost that silver bullet that if you want to eliminate all, you know, coal and gas and oil fired plants, nuclear power is it. Um, mm -hmm. Process heat, you know, just, um, you know, what does it take to, to melt steel? You know, nuclear heat can do it. Um, you know, there's all these different things that just get solved with, with nuclear. Um, but I also am cynical enough to think that um, it's not going to be available for the general public. It's going Fukushima. to be, yeah, Fukushima. This is there's there are always going to be this this uh, hang up about nuclear power that's going to make it scary enough to enough people where you you're not going to be able to set up your your dairy farm with a, a small nuclear power plant on it. Um, but which that's, is really that's, sad because the thorium yeah. plants, as opposed to the uranium, mm. you know, we're talking they would do one barrel of waste every like fifty years compared yeah. to a barrel every day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and just the transportation costs of all that. Um, again, when I was going out to California, it was amazing to see how much coal there was on trains um, out like by the Phoenix area. There was just, you know, a mile long train full of coal. Um, and, you know, it's it's like, you know, why are we doing this? Um, you know, you could do that. And I think it happens every couple of days. You know, with, with nuclear power, I I've heard that some of these big plants, they have the train come once, you're good for, for like a year or two. Um, and you're producing, you know, megawatts at a time. And so just in terms of the, the embodied energy of moving a train full of energy, you know, you're, you know, you're saving that by just, ha you know, transporting less and having a more energy dense fuel. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can have nuclear power trains, but you don't even need to put the... Um, the nuclear power plant on the train itself. You can have over in Europe, a lot of times what they have is with like the trolleys, they have this around the Philly area as well, where the trains are powered with overhead um, power. Electrical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so there's no reason why you can't have a nuclear power plant feeding into that and running the trains on completely green, zero carbon energy rather than a lot of these diesel um, trains. So. Yeah, I, I'm speaking on the energy. I really look forward to the higher technologies coming because that's our path to global freedom Absolutely. is developing these new energy technologies. Like I look forward to when people actually get the proof to the unanswerable equation, zero equals plus and minus infinity, which is mm. our key to zero point energy. Right. Definitely. To pull it, you know, to pull the electricity directly out of the vacuum of space time itself. Mm. I'm less familiar with that, but I mean, uh, I hope they, I hope they're able to do it because I think that's one thing is um, what really differentiates us from people 200 years ago is our access to energy. And this is something that I think when we, when we really look at, um, you know, what the developed world versus, you know, the, the developing world has, it's access to, you know, affordable, inexpensive energy. Mm -hmm. um, well, and we look at Germany. They're yeah. actually deindustrializing right now because they don't have the energy to run the plants in that. Like Volkswagen and mm. Mercedes shut down and are leaving Germany and coming to the U.S. because they don't have energy to even run the factories, and that's a permanent yeah. change. Yeah, and that's huge. And and um, and it doesn't need and it really doesn't need to be that way. It's it's um, you know, I really hope that you know we kind of are able to to look at. Um, yeah, the new technologies, old technologies, um, 
you know, th again, this is something that we don't need to really be here. And I, I think um, it's something that I think as as a culture, we've kind of gone away from what well, we need to uh, really um, do this on our own. We need to kind of figure out stuff on our own to, well, I just, you know, plug it in and my TV turns on. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that that's something that, um, you know, hopefully within, you know, that now that we've kind of seen the fragility of it, uh, we can kind of do stuff. But, um, you know, I, I really think, too, that there's something to be said for tried and true technology, stuff that mm -hmm. just works. Um, you know, it's I think this RAM pump. Yeah, exactly. RAM pump. Exactly. Um, gravity power, um, you know, just all, all the stuff where uh, flywheels, I think, are, are great in terms of, you know, if you're trying to store energy, um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, and then, you know, trying to reduce consumption somewhat. I mean, I think that that's something that um, when I, I lived with my grandmother for a little bit uh, over a summer and she lived up on the top of a mountain. And so she had all these skills of, of using very little water from when she was in Sicily because, you know, very like intermittent water there, uh, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. So um, being on well water, uh, you can't take 20 minute showers. You know, you can't, um, and then we had somebody living up there for, for a little bit after my grandmother passed away. They put an automatic flusher on there and the well went dry. And we had to actually drill a deeper well because they use so much water. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things where I, I used to see my grandmother taking the dishwasher and going out and watering her roses. And, um, this is, this is the type of stuff that when you're, um, kind of energy constrained or water constrained, you start to turn off those lights. You do that kind of stuff that, um, in terms of conservation, um, but then you also, um, try to say, okay, well, maybe I can scavenge a little bit here. Maybe, you know. Maybe I can don't need to plug in a uh, hundred watt, you know, incandescent light bulb. Maybe I need to, uh, you know, do a, um, you know, ionic uh, powered LED light bulb, um, you know, from the, you know, from the ionosphere and, you know, kind of find that appropriate technology for the application. Maybe a hundred watt light bulb is the right one because it actually provides heat. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing that I think that. Well, uh, and the longevity with the yeah. old light bulbs I, and i forget which firehouse i think it's in philly somewhere that's had like the same light bulb on for like 108 years straight now <laughs> yeah yeah well, i forgot the name of the the thing but there was actually like a um an agreement found between um different uh different light manufacturing companies that restricted how many hours the light bulb was allowed to go um and so it used to be yeah they would make these amazing resilient incandescent light bulbs that, yeah, there's one in San Francisco too. I think that uh, has lasted for 100 years, uh, and they they you know made them made it so that they had like a 10,000 hour life or something like that on purpose. Um, and um, yeah, because I mean, you know, the electric you know heat you know is um, I've seen somebody talk about this. I think it might have been Paul Wheaton talked about uh, who does um, like a, a permaculture course, and he's a kind of a controversial figure. He's weird. But uh, I thought it was kind of an interesting. Uh, uh, I've, I've heard some people who I also respect that are kind of in the off grid community not like him. So I'm not going to comment on him one way or the other. But um, I know that he was talking about how when he was working on his computer, just having an incandescent light bulb, you know, over his work environment kept him warm enough in wintertime. Um, and I've actually done this a little bit where I bought like an electric blanket. This is kind of an old fashioned technology now, just a resistance heater, but because it's heating me close to me, I'm not heating up my whole space. I'm able to use less power in terms of, you know, keep, you know, what temperature I need to keep the whole house at. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is something that, um, Boiler you know, heat is another one. Like that's what we have here at our house. Cause it's mm -hmm. an older farmhouse. Uh, it's what they have in Siberia and things. And they're just so much more efficient. Yeah. Like if we had forced air to heat our house, our gas bill would be double, triple or more. Yeah. Compared to what yeah. it is with boiler and we can turn off different zones. So like, Hey, these rooms, we don't really use much during the winter and yeah, just heat the main part of the house. Yeah. I have a, a gas boiler. My house was built in the twenties and, and uh, every so often I hear the whistling of the steam system, you know, the natural gas boiler. And, uh, and actually last year um, I, you know, I had, um, you know, I was having issues with my, with my boiler and I use electric heat for like maybe, you know, a few weeks, maybe three weeks. And my electric bill was insane. 
um, you know, just using small resistance heaters and, um, you know, going from that to using natural gas with the boilers and these cast iron, the cast iron works as a battery. It's mm -hmm. a thermal battery because the cast iron heats up, stores the heat there in the room and releases it. So it's not turning on and cycling all the time. Um, it's provided this thermal mass. And um, this is actually something I'm kind of doing now that's it's kind of springtime and it's warm during the day and cold at night. I'm opening up my my uh, doors and I saw the temperature in my house go from 70 up to 74 just using the solar energy on my porch. Um, and this is something that I think when you look at um, like Frank Lloyd Wright and a lot of the architects in the 20s and stuff like that, they were already looking at this thing of solar gain, you know, having an, an overhang so that in the summertime, you're not getting that heat in. But then when the when the sun is lower in the horizon in the wintertime, you're getting a lot of heat in. So it's kind of this um, this natural, you know, filter for well, what type, type time of year is it? And are, do we need heat gain or do we need to reject it? Do we need to you know, keep it out? Well, thank you. Thank, and, and it's all these little nuances and things like that, that every area is different. Every place is different. If you're more mountainous, Definitely. if you're more during the sea, you know, you got to use and adjust to your environment. Definitely. So, Philip, what is the best way for people to get a hold of you? And do you have any final words of wisdom on energy freedom? Yeah, um, so you can get a hold of me on Facebook. I have uh, set up a Facebook uh, group uh, that um, it's, uh, let me say I just set it up. It was Green uh, Paradise Lost. Um, and so if you guys want to kind of keep up with with my work um, and uh, what I'm doing in terms of the book, I'm going to try to post in there um, some of the green technology from the past and try to do that uh, on a regular basis in terms of uh, bringing up some of the old technology and stuff like that. And um, I think if people um, really want to do something in the short term to really provide energy independence, I would say, again, look at battery systems. And bat there's a lot of so like what they call solar generators um, that you can actually are, are full functioning power grids, power systems that you can have in your house and that you can charge with solar or the wall or whatever. And it will provide you that little bit of resiliency to um to be able to get through you know intermittent power outages that i think we're going to see as the grid gets more fragile um and um you know i think from there you can um and they're expensive now but there's you know just you know i think finding the ones that are uh, appropriate for your needs and where you can kind of um you know take things to kind of do that uh, would be big and um, i think also just in terms of public policy just um at, you know advocate for the removal of of subsidies for everything um, and because I think that that's something that um, what we see is the you know distortion in the energy market ends up creating hundred year long um, you know problems that we don't even know yet. So, well, there you go. Well, thank you, Philip, so much for being on. Everybody, make sure you like and subscribe to hear more about how you can get freedom in your life. This is Jedi signing off. Thanks so much, Jeff.